Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. It is uh, Claire Norman from the Cameron K. Gallagher Foundation, and we are um, in our series of Giving Tuesday conversations. And our lunchtime topic is the great pivot of 2020. And I'm very excited to be joined by my friends and colleagues from the CKG Foundation, Grace Gallagher, uh, the executive director and Cameron's mom, and Susan Lindsay, director of programs and a friend. And um, we're super excited today to just chat a bit together and in that dialogue, inform and share our heart with you about how we are shifting and how we did change um, before and after March of 2020 and where that lands in our program delivery. But the frame around it today is Giving Tuesday. And it's about celebrating generosity today. It's about celebrating mental health. It's about celebrating mental health every day. Giving Tuesday, you may or may not know, is part of a national movement. It began in 2012 as a way for individuals, communities, organizations to kind of come together and unleash the power of generosity as a way to kind of transform the world. And I can't think of a better alignment than really Cameron's dream at the CKG Foundation. She wanted to change the world by erasing stigma. She wanted to change the world by offering teens and their influencers ways to level up coping strategies, ways to just surrender and accept your beautiful, perfect self just as you are. And I don't know of a better day than Giving Tuesday as a time to search inside ourselves and celebrate the generosity we, we really all have deep inside of us. So we're excited to bring to you kind of how we have shifted the great shift of 2020, ways to connect to teens and their influencers. In the realm of just generosity, we're so grateful for our community and our supporters and just people interested in our mission, people who are interested in taking the priority light to their own mental health. So today, Susan, Grace, and I will dialogue a bit about where CKG Foundation kind of lands in that space of generosity. I'm going to start today talking a little bit about the word hope. It's one of our core values. It's something we say, we talk about holding hope. That's a two word phrase. There's another two word phrase we use a lot and that is everything matters, you matter. And so today I'd like to start by asking Grace to mention a bit about where hope sits in the foundation and maybe what hope means to her. And we'll pitch it off to Susan as well on that concept of hope and giving and generosity and celebration today. Well, thank you, Claire, and thank you everybody that's tuned in and listening. Um, before I go to the hope kind of piece of things, I do want to speak a little bit about being generous and let you into a little bit of um, this morning, every Tuesday morning, um, the team members of CKG, we have a team meeting and um, we really focused on what does generosity mean today? And sometimes generosity are dollars and time. And, um, you know, it's always easy when someone, when there's a baby that has fallen down and you reach over and you, you pick that child up, but how generous are we with our judgment and how generous are we with our non-judgment? So that's a little challenge I have for the, the Facebook people out there today and on this generous day to really focus on your generosity. But as Claire was talking about with hope, you know, hope is a core value of the Cameron K. Gallagher Foundation. And that can mean a lot of different things to a lot of people. And at CKG, we like to say, yes, we'll, we'll hold your hope, but really hope is not just a belief, it's an action item. Having hope can be really um, kind of surreal and out there in the world. And when you're in a dark place or you're struggling or if you're just having a bad day or we've all been in this 2020 year of what are we hoping for? It all seems so um, unending that hope is really all about action. And you have to remember sometimes the times you struggled that you got through that that's hope because you learned something from that. And maybe there's a practice from what you learned that can help you with your hope, can help you go forward with hope. You know, hope is there when you have goals. 
when you set a goal for yourself. If one day you just decide, you know what, today I'm going to get out of bed. That's a goal. And the way you do that is you lay in bed and you think, what is hope? I hope I can get out of bed. Well, I got out of bed yesterday or I didn't and that's okay. But I have action items. I have proactive tools that I need to take and hold on to so that I can take that hope, that belief and put it into action. And it's so important. And for people that are supporting others that when they really are just very lost and they can't even find those tools because it's a really difficult time, it's up to us to practice these tools so that we can be the hope and action for others. And that's what CKG does. We're hope and action for others. You know, I can't wait for Susan to share with you guys some of these tools that we practice with the kids, with the teens and how we have pivoted on with this new virtual world, um, but it's important. Hope is a really important word. And I hope everybody out there can define what their own action of hope means to them. Thank you, Grace. I think Susan, um, our director of programs has been working in the space really of innovation. It's a place where we're developing some tools, some ways to be able to tap into personal skills, strength and hope. Maybe Susan can take it from here and talk a little bit about what those programs look like. Yeah, thanks Blair. So our programs really are hope in action and we have pivoted. Um, so we're kind of doing what we did, but we're doing it in a new way. Um, so as a lot of you know, we did in-school workshops um, for middle school and high school students um, throughout the Richmond area pre-pandemic. Um, and so as far as that piece of our programming goes, we have pivoted um, and we are developing e-learning resources that we call toolkits um, because they really are providing tools for students to proactively care for their mental health. Um, so the first four topics that we're developing are life transitions, stress awareness, mental health awareness, and resilience. And we really felt like for what is going on in the world today and the challenges that teens face, um, especially right now during the pandemic, those were the most pertinent and important topics. So we have soft launched our life transitions toolkit um, to some specific local high schools, community organizations that work with teens to have students actually um, and teachers use this resource um, and then be able to provide us feedback so we can implement some changes um, and then have a larger rollout in early 2021. Um, and because when, when we do our large rollout, we really want it to be the best um, that it can be, although it'll be a constant um, updating and, and tweaking and improving as we go. Um, so, so that is how we do, we have adapted our, um, what were our in-school programs um, during the pandemic. We um, also had a program um, previously called Parent Chat Night, which has expanded um, and adapted, and we now call it Conversations with CKG. It was not just for parents, it's for anyone um, who supports teens. So could be we parents, we have lots of parents who attend, um, but it could be grandparents, could be coaches, could be youth leaders, um, anyone really. And we have had teens attend too recently, which is really exciting with their um, parent or caregiver. So in this series, um, it's a virtual conversation series and we um, talk about tough topics that pertain to teen mental health. Um, and we partner with other organizations in the community that are experts in the subject topic, um, as well as a licensed marriage and family therapist. Um, and what's really exciting um, is that our attendance has actually increased during the pandemic. And I think virtually it's a lot easier to hop on a call on a weeknight at home than to drive across town um, and attend in person. Um, and it's available you know, to anyone anywhere um, really in the world since it's virtual. Um, so we're excited about that increased reach. And then our other uh, main program delivery is our speak up clubs in high schools. And um, so of course those were also in person in schools. They're student led, student driven, um, student started clubs that focus on supporting the CKG mission. Um, and so now they meet um, once a month, we have an all school speak up club meeting. Um, we have one this Friday evening. Um, and so any teen and any high school is welcome. So if a school doesn't have a speak up club, um, your teen can log on and participate, um, which is also really exciting to be able to reach more teens. 
Yeah, Susan, that is really, it is very exciting. And what I'm hearing, and it's something we've said all along is that we are meeting teens right where they are. And um, by virtue of necessity, they're on their screens a whole lot more than they were um, before to function as students and even just as teens themselves with other commitments. And so we were able to, to meet teens exactly where they are and to connect with them in the best way we possibly could. I have an interesting question for y'all about the idea of connection, even through these kind of um, boxes called computers or phones and such. And you know, communities did embrace and continue to embrace the Speak Up 5K as a time to come together physically and celebrate the whole person, every part of us, the physical, the mental, the emotional, every bit of who we are and be completely authentic and celebrate the truth. And that is that the truth is not always pretty in every corner. Um, one of the great accomplishments of Cameron and the Cameron K. Gallagher Foundation is a way to mainstream and kind of normalize formerly siloed topics and conversations. And a lot of our successes are measured one conversation at a time, one teen at a time, one day at a time, as Grace said, when a teen got out of bed because they might have remembered that the Speak Up Club was meeting that day, and that's a true story, and others that we hear over time. But my, my specific question is that, you know, I talked to Haley Dalton this morning, a young adult perspective on mental well being, and she helped me understand that noticing the good and noticing generosity is what has been the most positive way for her to stay prioritizing her mental well being. So, in this virtual environment, we hear stories at our team meetings about things we're noticing, mission moments, places where we hear teens or people who have attended our conversations with CKG tell us what it means to them to be in connection with our work and our mission. And I wonder, even in this surreal space, Maybe Grace and Susan can talk to us about sort of the realities and the facts that we're still able to reach teens exactly where they are and hear those stories. We're noticing our work even in a pandemic era. Maybe one of you could get started on the stories, the things we're hearing, we're landing, the connections we're making through our work in this new way. Well, I would love to share a story. Um, there's a story about, um, this is actually pre-pandemic, but it, it speaks to the virtual world and how social media and, um, and other ways of communicating that are not face-to-face -face can make a real difference. Um, a few years back, we were in San Diego at a Speak Up 5K. And um, this family came um, because they heard of it through social media. They heard that this group from Virginia was coming out and throwing a Speak Up 5K. They um, investigated our website. They learned the story. They learned Cameron's story. And this young lady was 15 years old. And we were out in San Diego. And um, David and I were at the finish line and cheering people on as they crossed. And um, this beautiful young girl crossed the finish line and walked over to the side and was quite emotional. And I think when you have life experience, you can know when that, when that emotion is, is really deep and, and, and there's a life experience with that. Um, so we went over and talked to her and she simply said, I never knew someone cared this much about what I am suffering with. I am Cameron. I am the same girl. I am suffering. And I never knew someone would come across the country just to raise awareness to help someone like me. That's one person. And what she said that year to me is she said that sometimes she hurts so bad she cuts herself. And she doesn't want to cut herself, but she does. And that's the reality. Some people's pain feels so intense that it's their, their only release. And it's hard. It's hard to see. And, and she was suffering a lot. And she told me, if you come back next year, I will not cut myself because I can hold on to the hope that you still care. And I promised her we would, and we came back the next year and she crossed the finish line and she had the biggest smile on her face. She was so proud. She did not, I still get choked up thinking about it. She did not cut herself. And the following year she brought her little sister who she saw was struggling and they crossed the finish line together holding hands and you could tell they were in it together and they felt a community around them. 
And that was all done pre-pandemic, but it was done through social media. It was done through different avenues that way that they were even able to hear and investigate that there was this foundation out there in Virginia that was going to rock the mental health world and show people that we care. And we do it in a variety of different ways. So that, that's my story of impact that I hold with me every day. You know, there's days I wake up that I don't, I don't feel like I have a lot of hope to hold on to. It's hard, it's really, really hard. And the reason why I'm here is because I have to be my daughter's voice because you can't hear hers right now. And for me to be able to do that, I can listen to her voice. I can listen to this beautiful young girl who crossed the finish line in San Diego and I can hear her voice and I can say, I'm doing this because one life matters. One life matters because every life matters. And that's, and, and, the, and we say it, it's because you're worth it all, every bit of this work. So that's my story that I would like to share with you all today. I, you know, I've heard that story before um, and it still gave me chills <laughs> <laughs> to hear it this morning. It does, and that's just one. You know, I know that there's been, um, there was a young man in our, um, one of our Speak Up clubs that um, was able to come and reach out for help when he was suffering in silence. Um, and, and really, I often tell our team and, and different people out there in the community, we don't have to know all the success stories. We have to believe in the success stories. We have to keep doing the work. And there's a lot of success stories we will never know. And there's a lot of ripple effects that even within our the adults helping us deliver this work, their lives are changing. Their mental health is improving. It's true. And I know Susan shares with us often too, you know, feedback she gets um, overtly and sometimes covertly from people that participate in the current offerings as well. I wonder if you, if anything comes to mind, Susan, that you feel comfortable to share around that. Um, I will say, I think that the, um, you know, mental health is still a really tough topic for a lot of people, especially what, you know, we've had our conversations with CKG series has tackled um, supporting LGBTQ mental health, teen mental health, um, talking to teens about healthy sexual relationships, consent, um, you know, some really t tough topics, you know, a lot of times parents have, you know, teens are growing up in a very different world with the internet um, than we did, especially when you talk about sex education and what they have access to. And, um, you know, so it's, um, it's hard for parents to know what to say and how to respond. And, um, and I think that the, the one thing I've noticed about our virtual offering of conversations with CKG is that it allows some anonymity um, that meeting in person did not. Um, and, you know, we love to see everyone's face and have their videos on, but it's also fine to turn off the video um, and to chat questions um, and have a little anonymity um, but I think also just by showing up and participating, even if it's without video on, um, just, you know, those adults' presence lets everyone else who's there know that they're not alone. None of us have all the answers. Um, we're all figuring it out and trying to support teens the, the best we can in a world that's different than we grew up in and has different stressors. Um, you know, I had a conversation with an older gentleman back, this was probably early September. And he, you know, he said, I don't know why kids are so stressed out today. You know, when I was a kid, I got up and had to feed my <laughs> in the morning and, <laughs> you know, just a different, it's a different world. Yeah. Um, and I think sometimes it can be hard to understand, you know, why, why is it different? Why is there a mental health crisis with teens? Um, and so the only way that we support teens is by learning together. Yeah. Uh, you know, I love, I love how, Susan, you said how the, you know, the parents really um, need the language as well, right? So, and they need the research that we bring to them. You know, it, it, the kids' brains are being inundated with information at a much faster speed, um, regardless of whether it's good, bad, or indifferent information, it's coming in at a much faster speed than what any of us ever experienced. And that does change your brain. I mean, you can research all the MRI images and um, the cortisol levels in everybody's body and, and what's happening younger and younger in ages. 
And, um, and I think it's important for us as parents to understand how that brain is working. How is that teenage brain working? How is that young adult, that emerging adult's brain working? And it also, it's, I think it's funny, Susan, you and I have talked a lot about how sometimes during this process of learning, we look back at ourselves and our younger selves and we think, oh, that's why we did that. Or that's why we were thinking that way or not thinking that way. And it's fascinating. The brain is a beautiful thing and it's fascinating. And um, I think the more we learn together and the more that the us as parents, caregivers, teachers, coaches, we understand the language of the child, the language of the teen, then that communication can just change so much in someone's life. You know, Grace, what you're showing is um, generosity of spirit as much as you are showing hope and action. And I think what Susan described about how we are living forth our mission and purpose through these specific programs is the real life hope and action. It's the real life enabling of these conversations to destigmatize. And Grace, you were so um, beautifully able to exemplify why the CKG Foundation is different. And that is that we accept the whole person and that everyone has a brain and thereby we reduce stigma and we understand that these conversations belong to all of us. These conversations um, are necessary for all of us, not just to understand, but to project empathy and compassion. And Susan, I know one of the things we do um, in the toolkits and in our other mental wellness education endeavors is to um, skill build around coping strategies and to, to really put into practice some habits to help walk teens and their influencers toward maybe a more positive view of prioritizing mental health and wellness and some real actionable behaviors that will help with not anxiety reduction because we can't really reduce anxiety, we can just learn to navigate it. So I wonder, you know, we've talked about hope and the holding of that, we have some very, um, clear examples of um, hope and action. And I wondered um, about this concept of generosity of spirit. I, wonder, I know that's a, it's a bit of an um, abstract sounding term, um, but for me and for my conversation with Haley, it's about just showing up. Generosity on Giving Tuesday is being celebrated all over the country um, as a way to tap into treasures, treasures of time, treasures perhaps of funds or resources, but CKG is taking a different spin. You know, we're not going in the direction of fund request on Giving Tuesday. We're asking for a celebration and a celebration of generosity and generosity of spirit. And I just wondered, um, as we move toward um, some of specific questions about practices and ways to really skill build in mental health and well-being, what your ideas are of this concept of generosity of spirit. Um, Giving Tuesday, the national collaboration has been using that term. You know, CKG did not kind of make that up in the mix of our um, webinars for today. But um, I know Haley Dalton in our earlier webinar said that she saw generosity of spirit in conversations. And I wondered in each of you, and you know there's no right or wrong answer. That's kind of what we, what we know to be the truth in our work what each of you thought around the concept of generosity of spirit and where that shows up in your work at CKG. I, um, I'll start and say, I think um, if you're human, you have probably at some point in your life experienced depression and or anxiety um, to some degree. I think there's scales, um, you know, of, of how severe someone experiences that. But I think that when you are in a good place, um, you can take that experience in your life and you can be supportive of people who are currently struggling. And to me, I think that that is generosity of spirit. Um, that it, and you know, that's in, in action. It's generosity of spirit in action. And I believe that generosity and spirit um, requires a great deal of courage because it, it also requires a sense of vulnerability, right? So if you know, it, not that you have to share your story if you don't want to, um, but it, it requires you to go back into that space that maybe was a little bit difficult and hard to recognize how you can support someone. Um, and so I think it takes courage. Um, I think it takes a self-awareness. Um, and I think it takes a, um, a perception of stepping back sometimes 
and looking at the world at a larger vantage point. A lot of times um, when you're in that dark place or in just a bad day, it does feel a little bit like a tunnel. You know, it feels, it feels like a tunnel and it's sometimes you're deeper in the tunnel and harder to climb out. But other times the, the light's just on the other side, but, but you have that, um, that maybe even that memory of that person that was generous to you. Um, I will share a story. There was a, a young lady that swam with Cameron and um, she wrote me a letter after Cameron passed away and said, she did not know me very well, but there was one practice that I was really struggling with the practice. And I saw this girl who was going and just seems to have no trouble with it whatsoever. And she turned around and not many people talked to me at practice, but she turned around and said to me, I'm really having a hard time with this practice as well. Don't worry about it. It's almost over. And that was generous. And it held on to this girl for this girl because then she was like, okay, I, you know, at that moment, she felt like she was alone. She felt like she was the only one having a hard time. Now that may have been a swim practice, but think about how many people that are alone in their struggles and feeling like they are the only one that is feeling this way. Um, and that simple reach out of a, a generous hello, that's why we say everything you do matters. It, it makes a difference in people's life. You don't know that, that hello, what that can change, that opening the, the door to help somebody into the, the local Starbucks. You don't know what that can do. So everything you do does matter. And I know in, in this Giving Tuesday, I would be really um, not doing my job if I did not mention this, but I would ask that if you do have some funds available, a dollar on up, please think about the work we're trying to do here because we're growing these toolkits and there's people out there that don't necessarily have access to the internet. And we're really trying to develop toolkits that we can get out into the communities there that don't have that access. Um, you know, we're trying to develop a Spanish version of these toolkits eventually because everyone matters and all these toolkits are excellent. And I want them in the hands of as many, many people as possible. So if you do have a little bit of that generosity in you, please do give because we could use it and it'll be go straight out there doing the mission work. You know, Grace, you, you really kind of exemplified as you often do in it, the research. And the research, sh research shows that in giving, you know, there is goodness that comes to the giver and the receiver. And even though Cameron was suffering that day with that drill and that practice herself, she was able to also help another. And I feel sure that she actually felt a bit better too when she was able to reach into someone else's space of suffering. And that is where the research shows that generosity, it's a celebration today of that. It's not just, you know, where you choose to give money, time and, and spirit. It, it's where you also feed yourself as a way to connect with other humans. And we are all in this together. We all have brains and we should all be paying very good attention to our health and mental well-being. Um, I'd like to um, move forward with the idea that um, parallel to generosity is this idea of gratitude. And gratitude is a practice for a lot of people, as is many other mental well-being skills that we teach and hopefully do. You know, we would be no good as the Cameron K. Gallagher Foundation if we didn't have any personal sense of mental well-being practices that we do ourselves. So as we kind of move toward, you know, the, the latter part of this conversation, um, I'd like to ask Susan and Grace, I'll answer it too, what are some personal practices that you do? We have to walk our talk. That's what we had to do when the pandemic hit. We had to reach into the skills of showing up when it's hard and to be there to keep the work going. But it didn't just happen by magic. There's a practice involved. And the practice isn't always fun or easy, but it's worth it. And I wondered if each of you would mind um, sharing what you might do in your personal life to, to care for your mental well-being. Well, I'm happy to go. <laughs> and then Susan, I'll let you go. <laughs> um, I think one bear, um, one thing that sounds easy, but is, is hard to do, um, is getting outside and walking. You know, I, I happen to enjoy running, but there's times I get out of that running routine and it's hard to get back in and I can feel it. I can not just only feel it in my body, I feel it in my mood. I feel it in my reactions to others around me, I might be less patient, I may be less focused, um, I may not sleep as well. 
So um, I really believe being, for me, getting outside, um, being near nature and getting, and getting some, my heart rate up, it really helps with my stress levels. If just, even if it's for 30 minutes, just I'm not super fast and I don't claim to be, but if I get that heart rate up and I'm a much, um, I'm a much better me. And that feels good when I'm a better me. So that's one thing I, I really do. And the other thing that just sounds so simple, but it's something you have to concentrate on is taking that breath and pausing. And it goes from anything from as a mother where something may come at me and my immediate reaction is to fix, to action. And that may not be the right thing to do. Maybe I need to pause. Maybe I need to take a breath and I need to then move into the action. And I need to do that in my personal life, in my professional life, in my social life, in my relationships. Um, no one ever says, man, I wish I had waited to send that email. <laughs> you know, like they, they, they're saying, oh, they, if they send it too quickly, then they're like, oh, why did I do that, right? Um, so even a funny example this morning, I was I had to get up early and get um, one of my children to the dermatologist and we're getting in the car, we're rushing out and she looks at me and goes, wow, you seem really stressed. And I'm like, I am. And I just snapped at her and she's like, maybe you should take a breath. And it was great. It was awesome. And that's just a silly little example. But that breath, if you're a teen, can save you from yelling at a referee and getting kicked out of the game. And as an adult, it can save you from making maybe a decision that wouldn't be as healthy. So I normally, I do, I totally agree with getting outside and, and fresh air and going for a walk. And, you know, about nine months ago, I would have said, you know, exercise, you know, I also am, I'm not super athletic, but I it just, you know, I feel better after I do it. Um, but I have surprised myself, you know, I was for the first probably six months um, of this pandemic, getting up, going to the gym, working out outside, getting up early, like early. Um, and I just, I was like falling asleep at two 30 every afternoon. I was just dead tired. Um, and I, you know, I said, I, ha something has to give in my life with what I've taken on. And so I, I, that's what I let go of, um, which normally I wouldn't recommend because I do think exercise is really important for mental health. Um, but, it, and I had to just be kind to myself about it and not feel guilty, um, and, you know, there'll be a time when it's, you know, we'll come back into my life um, and play a bigger role. But I think um, it was a good lesson in like self forgiveness of like, it's okay to let go of something. Um, and, you know, it's really nice not to fall asleep at three uh, every afternoon. <laughs> well, Susan, I think what you actually did was a coping skill we do recommend, which is take a look at how dense your calendar is and, 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 you know, create some space to breathe like Grace does. And, and um, you know, I know for me, I, I exercise always has always been a place to reduce stress and, and whatnot. And, um, but this is going to sound crazy, but I think a steady diet of water, lots of hydration all day long. I know um, it's a simple kind of go-to, but these are the kind of reminders that are available to all the teens and all of us that we build in to our, our programming so that people kind of have those aha moments and realize that we can let go of some of the anxiety around trying to reduce anxiety because we can, you know, we do have some skill and power to be able to navigate anxiety. And um, that is our work. That is our work. Um, but I'd like to move toward a closing question, which um, I uh, posed to Haley, who answered it so beautifully this morning. And it sounds perhaps a little odd, but I think one of the things that we ask teens to do is not just become aware of your brain from the science perspective and the beauty and the biology of the breath, or perhaps even also coping skills. There's an extra layer called self-compassion that's kind of a polish on all of the work that we do. And that is to allow yourself to be just as you are and not have to change a thing. You really are just fine, it's just like you are. Um, but also to develop a friendship with yourself and to be able to treat yourself like you do your friends. And um, so I'm asking our adult panelists today to um, think back to their 10 year old self 
and just take a little mindful moment breath and call to mind that young, young version of you. And maybe decide what about that version of you are you grateful for? Something you might be proud of about that person or maybe something you just notice about your 10 year old self that deserves some of that attention and compassion. Um, and that's still with you. That, that is absolutely still with you. And I'm not off the hook, I'll answer the question too. Um, but I wondered if um, Susan or Grace wouldn't mind jumping in um, with, with that 10 year old, it's not always easy, that 10 year old self. What, what is that um, about that time frame and that person that you want to kind of hold, uh, hold hope for and acknowledge? I'll, I'll go first. Um, this is, it's a, that's a tough question for me um, because we moved to another state um, when I was 10 or right, right before I turned 10. Um, and it was really hard. I had, it was a hard transition for me. It was a very different. We moved from pretty, a pretty rural area to a very suburban area and culturally it was very different. Um, and so it's, it's, I just, would I, I'm not sure how to answer exactly other than I would tell my 10 year old self like it gets better like you'll go through hard times and it will get better and then you'll go through more hard times <laughs> and then that'll get better too and that's what life is um, and I've thought of I've actually thought about that move a lot as I've developed the life transitions toolkit because man it would have been helpful <laughs> to have that toolkit and that information um, when I was that age. Yeah, I think it's something so important that we can't always um, just make a silver lining out of everything. I think the way that you navigate through some of those hard times is acknowledging it and just being very truthful and saying, you know what, that 10 year old self had a hard time, you know, and that there, because everybody doesn't have a great day every day. And if you look back to that 10 year old self at that time, when you moved, you probably thought it was the absolute most horrible thing in the world that you would never, ever get through and never have another friend again and never love where you live again. And then look how many different places you've lived in your life. And it's like a little building block. Um, when I think back to my 10 year old self, um, I laugh about lots of different things. I had a very, um, I made everybody call me Daisy for a little bit. <laughs> I changed my name from Grace to Daisy because I, I just thought it would be okay to do that and I wouldn't answer. So I think I, I think I think that 10 year old self for just doing her own thing and holding strong with that. But I also um, think about there was a at, when I was 10 I was auditioning for a role um, at a dance studio and I was so nervous going into that studio. And I remember the smell of the studio. I remember what, I mean, like right now, my stomach feels nervous thinking about it. I didn't want, I almost didn't open that door to walk in the studio. I got through the audition and some people would say, oh, when you walked out in the waiting room, weren't you just like, ah, oh, that's over. No, I still wanted to throw up. I thought I bombed it. That is awful. I'm never auditioning for anything again. Why did I even think, I mean, talk about the negative voice. Why did I even think I could do this? Um, and two days later, I get a phone call that I got the role. And, and what I say about that is I let that negative voice for two days, tear me down. And then two days le later, I got that positive feeling of being really proud of myself. So now when the negative voice comes in, I may not always stop it, but I may not let it sit there for two days. I might let it just sit there for two minutes. And then I'm going to move on to a more positive, friendly voice inside. Well, um, some of you may or may not know that Grace is my sister, and I remember Daisy, and um, <laughs> that was a really funny time for us. But what I'm going to share is not funny, and um, but that's life, you know. That's part of what what we celebrate at the Cameron K Gallagher Foundation is the whole story. So when I was 10, we had very recently lost an infant brother, and I was so sad about that. And but my concern was for my mother. And um, Grace is the, the sixth of seven. And so I was worried about everyone else and really just watching my mother navigate that heartbreak for her. And I just don't know that at 10 that I really allowed myself to feel it. And so for many years after that, I can tap back into the brother I never got to grow up with. And I feel like 
what I have held is the hope to see him again. And that's the holding of hope. Um, but even so, just knowing that a severe loss um, like that brings about the need for love, support, and generosity of spirit to yourself, and also to be willing to receive it from others who are also suffering. You know, every, you, know you can suffer and be joyous. It's not mutually exclusive. You can offer help and be sad at the same time sometimes. And I, I think what I'm hearing from Susan and Grace and kind of back to the, the person that I'm thinking of when I was 10 is, I wish we could all just hold those little people that are now in big bodies and give them big hugs. <laughs> and, you know, in 2021, maybe we'll be able to do that again. But, you know, no matter what, the CKG Foundation will be right where you are, even if it is on a screen, um, one day again in person. But we will milk this opportunity the best we can to bring this mission and message forward. And in the spirit of Giving Tuesday, I'm so grateful for Grace for being courageous to ask for the actual support monetarily, um, because that's a, a time that it, it's an appropriate time to certainly ask for that on Giving Tuesday. And we're so appreciative of your time today on Facebook Live. Um, we're appreciative of your support of our mission and we're appreciative for you to consider your own mental health. So celebrating you and generosity and mental health all at once. I'll, um, I'll finish with that. I wonder if Susan or Grace have any comments as we move toward our, our 45 minute um, top side limit on our talk today. Is there anything you'd like to add before we finish up? I just would like to say thank you for everyone that has supported us in the past. Um, thank you for your support with your time and um, thank you for having the conversation. Please reach out to someone today, tomorrow, especially through the holiday season. Keep reaching out. If someone does not call you back, if somebody does not text you back, do not stop. Just keep reaching out. Yeah, I mean, I can't top that. That was a great <laughs> wrap up. So <laughs> thank you to everybody for watching. Um, and so for supporting the Cameron K. Gallagher Foundation and um, teen mental health in general. Come back at four o'clock. We'll have an interesting conversation um, inclusive of um, the business community. And we have some leaders to talk a bit about what it means to translate generosity into work culture and what that means for teams who are expected to be high performing, but also super good people. So we're excited to bring that to you as well on this Giving Tuesday. So happy December and um, we hope to see you on screen or in person sometime soon. Bye, everyone. Bye.